Carla. Tanishta, when I spoke on the family referendum in the Dáil a few weeks ago, I agreed we do need to widen the definition of family in the Constitution to include, for example, one-parent families, non-married non families, grandmothers, grandchildren, etc. And I, like many others speaking in the Dáil that day, mostly women, I might add, while supporting the aspirations of the amendment, had considerable difficulty in the term durable relationships. Now, relationships are complex and unique. One person's idea of a durable relationship might be, well, let's live together for a year or two, see how it works out. Durable relationships are hugely influenced by a person's expectations, by their hopes and beliefs, and by their dreams. It emanates as much from the heart and the gut as it does from the head. As one reporter in a daily newspaper said, I have been in a number of durable relationships. Only two of them ended in marriage. Did I love the people in those relationships? Sure. For the years of commitment, would I attest to it in court? Yes. Yes, I would at the time. Now, no. And therein lies the difficulty, Tanishta. When durable relationships end, what happens to the rights of those adults and children in that family? And if there are several durable relationships, how are rights adjudicated? So now that the state is stepping in, and without any legal framework, is according the status of family to all durable relationships, which is fine. But I believe the very least we owe ordinary men, women, and especially children is some kind of legal framework in which they have some protection that they can rely on for their rights and protections as a family. So, for example, how can a person go to revenue and say, I'm in a durable relationship in a family and I want the same tax treatment as other families? If the revenue object, will they have to go to court or will the revenue just say, yeah, that's fine? How can a person of clarity about succession rights, about claims to property ownership, if the status of their family based on a durable relationship, and this is crucial, can only be decided retrospectively by the courts where there is a dispute? And these are real everyday issues that people are bringing up with me, and I have no answers other than you may have to go to Thank court, you, and I await your answers. My final question is, why didn't you trust this House to give some legal framework or guidelines to those who wish to assert their family status by means of a durable relationship? Thank you, Deputy, for, for, for raising the issue and raising the question. Um, could I say at the outset we have a constitutional framework and we have a legal framework, which this Oireachtas have provided through a variety of laws, and I'll deal with that in a second. But on the constitutional front, durable relationships, as you quite correctly said at the outset of your contribution, is about including couples with or without children, single parents and their children, grandparents raising their children. 42% of Irish children in 2022 were born to an unmarried couple. Uh, and therefore, it's important that the Constitution reflects that reality. And I think people are broadly supportive of that. But what is equally important, and you asked, you know, where is the protection? And the, the existing text of the Constitution provides guidance in determining whether a given relationship can be considered a family under the Constitution. Because the family is described as the natural, primary, and fundamental unit group of society, quote from the Constitution, and a moral institution possessing alienable and imprescriptible rights. Uh, Article 41.2 goes on to observe that the family is the necessary basis of social order and indispensable to the welfare of the nation and the state. And that text remains unchanged under the proposed um, amendment. And that ensures that the Constitution protection uh, and recognition afforded to the family that will be afforded is not extended to casual or transient relationships. But on the, the body of law that exists, I mean, there's a huge body of law on welfare, on taxation, 
on family unification that already exists. Um, and, you have, and rights and benefits are usually created by legislation. So the Oireachtas has that and the executive of the day has that function. So persons' taxation obligations are set out in the Taxes Consolidation Act of 1997 and related legislation. A person's entitlement to social welfare is largely set out in the Social Welfare Consolidation Act of 2005. Family reunification rights are set out in the International Protection Act of 2015. And you reference the Succession Act. That was probably one of the great radical moves of the 20th century. 1965, as Charles J. Hawley introduced that at the time, it was described by international legal people as the end of feudalism in Ireland, where it gave uh, uh, women the right to succession. Uh, and that, that act uh, is still there and, of course, uh, sustains. Um, so the, the family amendment doesn't repeal, the, 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 sorry, the proposed family amendment that we're bringing in it does not seek to repeal alter or amend the rights or obligations of persons that exist under these statutes. It's very important that we don't try and confuse it. Uh, and well, that's very clear, by the way. It doesn't seek to do any of that. Uh, and equally, the legislature will continue to retain its entitlement. So you ask, why don't we leave it up? The Oireachtas, every year, is entitled to set rational social welfare, taxation, and, and immigration policies in pursuit of the common good. We retain that right within this house um, uh, 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 and so forth. Deputy Harkin. Thank you, Tanish. My concern is that legal ambiguity around durable relationships, which are or will be families if the referendum is passed, only arises where there's disputes between the members of that family, between revenue and that family. And given that we have no legal framework, the only way to resolve those disputes seems to me to go to the court, and maybe one court after another, right up to the Supreme Court. You mentioned a lot of legislation. I can only comment on one. You talked about the Family Reunification Act 2015. The most recent case on that is the 2020 case in the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court said that uh, we're talking about the durability of a relationship. They said, and I quote, a durable relationship will tend to be one of some duration, but that is not to say that the dur durability of the relationship is in itself a defining feature. It says it is perfectly possible for a committed long term, what is often called a serious relationship, to exist between two persons who have known one and another for a short time. Now, that conflicts what you spoke about a minute ago, you, about transient relationships. And the, the outcome of this case We're was they time, said please. that the minister could not make a two-year cohabitation requirement mandatory for family reunification, that the minister has overtime. flexibility. And that's the problem, Tanishta. It's unclear, it's please. uncertain, and families really do deserve better. I think it's very clear. I just spelt it out in terms of the taxation question. There is legislation that governs taxation. We have the Civil Partnership and Cohabitation Act, which we passed in this House. All of these issues have been set out in clear legal, but the legal frameworks are there. Social Welfare Act of 2000, Social Welfare Act of 2005, uh, the, uh, tax, the tax, Taxes Consolidation Act of 1997, the Family Reunification, uh, sorry, the International Protection Act of 2005, which deals with family protection um, rights. Uh, so I think there has been attempts, I'm not saying you're involved in this, to try and muddy the water and create confusion. But there's a constitutional framework there, and there's two great strengths of our constitution. One is the power to amend that the people have, which we're now exercising. The second is judicial interpretation. Judicial interpretation has been there since the beginning of the constitution, uh, which made it a radical constitution in the 1930s in the context of fascism and everything, that the executive of the day actually ceded some of its rights, and the Oireachtas did, to the courts. We did that back Thank in 37. You, Tanish, it's quite a up. radical thing to do when states were taking power in. So my point is, there are two frameworks here. You have your constitutional framework, Time is it's a up. written constitution, which will always be subject 
to judicial interpretation. But you have the legal framework which the Oireachtas passes in terms of succession, Sorry, in terms of taxation, and social protection. Apologies, I'm, you know, I'm engaged. Oh, you're in say. full flight. Yeah. 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 Sorry. But I, I would appeal to people, Apologies. please, just to adhere to the uh, time that is allowed.